Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our 2019 Full Year Results Conference Call. I'm joined by Jean-Francois Van Boxmeer, our CEO, and Laurence Debreu, our CFO, for today's call. Following some prepared remarks on the results, we will be happy to take your questions. With that, I would like to hand the call over to Jean-Francois. Thank you, uh, Federico, and good morning, uh, everyone. I, I, I know that you might have some questions about the press release of yesterday, uh, but for now, I'd like to uh, concentrate on our full year 2019 earnings uh, uh, results. And, um, and so starting immediately on slide two, uh, we delivered another year of superior top-line growth with continued strong performance in the second half. Organic net revenue buyout was up 5.6%. Growth was well-balanced with beer volume up 3.1% and net revenue per hectoliter up 3.3% due to robust pricing and premiumization in all regions. The Heineken brand growth accelerated to 8.3%, the best performance in a decade. The growth was across many geographies with more than 40 markets delivering double-digit growth. We closed the year with an operating profit by a growth of 3.9% and an operating profit by a margin of 16.8%, down 12 bips. In a context of increased input costs, we have continued working on the efficiency of our operations while steadily investing behind our brands, our sustainability agenda, and our digital transformation. Net Profit Bea increased 4.3% organically, slightly ahead of operating profit Bea growth as lower financing costs partially, partially offset higher taxes. Diluted EPS Bea was 4.38 euro per share, an increase of 5.5% driven by net profit Bea and a positive benefit from currency translation for want. Looking ahead to 2020 and bearing uh, major negative macroeconomic and political developments, we expect our operating prof profit bayout to grow by mid-single digit on an organic basis. Now let me turn to slide three, where you can see an overview of our performance with organic net revenue bayout growth in all regions and double-digit growth in Asia-Pacific. Price mix on a constant geographic basis was up 3.4%, driven by share increases and premiumization across all regions, starting with Africa, Middle East, and Eastern Europe. The consolidated beer volume grew 4.6% organically, and price mix was up 2.9% on a constant geographic basis. The premium portfolio increased double digit with strong performance of Russia, South Africa, Nigeria, and Ethiopia. Organic net revenue growth was up 8.9%, with Nigeria flat despite an increase in excise duty. Regional operating profit bayer was stable as the growth in South Africa, Russia, the DRC, Egypt, and Ethiopia was offset by declines in Nigeria and Ivory Coast. In the Americas, consolidated beer volume was up 2.6% organically, following a strong fourth quarter with 5.2% growth. Price mix on a constant geographic basis was strong at 7.1%, mainly driven by Brazil, with growth in the mid-teens due to premiumization and pricing. In Mexico, pricing was ahead of inflation and beer volume grew low single digit, with the double-digit growth of the premium portfolio led by Heineken, the launch of Heineken 00, and the successful rollout of Amstel Ultra. The impact of the OXO contract renewal continued in line with our expectations, and additional locations have begun operating under the new terms from January 2020. In Brazil, the Heineken brand Amstel and Divasa grew strong double digit, whilst the economy portfolio declined high single digit, following two price increases in the year. In the US, beer volume declined mid single digit, 
The Heineken brand was slightly down, including the benefit from the introduction of Heineken Zero Zero. Operating profit bear for the Americas was up 4.6% organically, with growth in Mexico and Brazil was partially offset by the U.S. In Asia-Pacific, consolidated beer volume grew 11.8%, with double-digit growth in Vietnam, Cambodia, Myanmar, Korea, and Japan. Price mix was up 0.8% on a constant geographic basis. In Vietnam, we grew strongly on the back of favorable beer market conditions, and our portfolio expansion strategy driven by Tiger, La Rue, and Heineken, supplemented by the launch of Heineken Silver. The region delivered organic operating via growth of 12.1%, driven by Vietnam and Cambodia. In Europe, consolidated beer volume was marginally lower on an organic basis, with the region back to growth in the second half. The premium and low and no alcohol portfolios grew mid-single digit, with Heineken 00 growing mid-double digit. Price mix was up 1.8% on a constant geographic basis, driven by the growth of Heineken, Desperados, Pira Moretti, local premium brands, and Kraft. In the UK, beer volume increased low single digit, driven by the premium portfolio, whilst cider declined high single digit, largely due to the challenging comparable of last year when we had great weather and the Football World Cup. In France, beer volume declined slightly, but outperformed the market driven by the growth of our craft and premium portfolio. In Italy, beer volume was a mid-single digit, driven by Ignusa and Messina. Spain declined slightly, with our craft and cider portfolios growing double digit. In Poland, beer volume was down high single digit, mainly driven by our economy portfolio. In the Netherlands, beer volume declined mid-single digit due to a challenging comparable versus the good summer last year. Regional operating profit Bea decreased 0.8% organically, impacted by a significant step up in investments to upgrade our technology and digital platform in the region. Now, turning to slide four, the Heineken brand accelerated its growth to 8.3% to deliver its best growth in more than a decade. Growth came from many markets led by double-digit growth in Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, Nigeria, the UK, Romania, and Germany. Brazil is now the largest market for the Heineken brand globally, and with the addition of the UK and Nigeria, 12 markets now sell more than 1 million hectoliters of the brand. The successful rollout of Heineken 00 continues and is now available in 57 markets. The brand will be the official beer partner of the UEFA Euro 2020 and has extended its partnership with the Champions League until 2024. Turning to slide 5, I would like to share some highlights on other drivers of our strong top-line growth. Our portfolio of international brands grew high single-digit, driven by the double-digit growth of Tiger in Vietnam and Cambodia, and Amstel in Brazil, Mexico, Russia, South Africa, and the UK. Our craft portfolio grew mid-single digit, driven by double-digit growth in Europe, more than offsetting lower volume in the Americas. Lagunitas is now available in 35 markets, with local production in the Netherlands and Brazil. Volume of our low and no alcohol portfolio increased, increased high single digits, to 14.1 million hectoliters. The no alcohol portfolio grew double digit, driven by Heineken 00, line extensions of other leading brands and beer mixes. Cider volume was stable at 5.6 million hectoliters with double digit growth outside the UK, especially in South Africa and Russia. In the UK, volume declined, as I said earlier, high single digit, and we see encouraging results in new cider markets like Vietnam and Mexico. Revenue from our proprietary draft systems grew double digit. 
The Blade, our countertop draft system, is now available in 32 markets. We continue to deploy our e-commerce platforms to digitally connect with our customers. Today, our digital B2B platforms are operational in 17 markets, and Beerwolf, our B2C business-to-consumer platform in Europe, continues to gain scale. Moving now to slide six on sustainability. Brewing a better world is one of our five strategic priorities. It addresses our commitments to promote health and safety in our operations, protect our water resources, reduce CO2 emissions, source sustainably, advocate responsible consumption, and grow with the communities where we operate. Over the past decade, we have lowered our water usage by almost a third to 3.4 hectoliters of water per hectoliter produced, and 3.1 hectoliters in water-scarce areas in 2019, ahead of our 2020 targets. So in March 2019, we introduced our 2030 water ambition, which is called Every Drop. And next to the continuous improvement in water consumption, we aim to improve the water catchment areas surrounding our production site. Today, 15 of the 24 of our breweries in water-scarce areas have started water balancing projects, including nature-based solutions like reforestation and also wetland restoration. In 2018, we set out our Drop the Sea program to reduce CO2 emissions. With an ambitious target to power our production facilities with 70% renewable thermal energy and electricity by 2030. Thermal energy accounts for nearly 80% of total energy consumption in a brewery. We are at the beginning of this journey and reached 19% in 2019. In 2019, we increased our local sourcing percentage of agricultural supplies in Africa to 44%. Although we made progress, we have much more to do to reach our ambition of 60% in 2020. So we are far off. We spend over 10% of Heineken media budgets on when you drive, never drink, or other responsible consumption awareness campaigns in more than 60 markets. We aim to reduce our plastic use and contribute to increased collection and recycling of plastic where possible. To have the biggest positive impact, we use regional strategies that take into account the maturity of each region, the local use of plastic, and the current availability of recycling infrastructure. And with that, I am finished, and I will hand over to Laurence, who will talk about the hard numbers. Laurence, over to you. Thank you, Jean-François, and good morning, everyone. Um, let's turn now to slide seven and the financial overview of the year. Uh, looking at the net revenue Bayer of 23.9 billion euro, organic growth for the year was 5.6%. Revenue per hectoliter Bayer grew 3.3%, with an underlying price mix effect of 3.4 on a constant geographic basis. Um, beyond the continued premiumization of the portfolio, we were very intentional in taking price in a year of significant input cost inflation. Operating profit Bayer grew 3.9% organically. The strong top line performance was partially offset by the input cost inflation of, of around 5% in line with our guidance of mid-single digits and incremental investment behind our brands and our digital transformation. I will provide more context in the following slides on this. Operating profit margin Bayer was slightly down by 12 basis points, driven by the impact of our incremental investments. And as you know, we restated the 2018 numbers for the accounting impact of IAS 37. Net profit Bayer reached 2.5 billion euros, up 4.3% organically. And here we had some benefit from lower interest rates, but also a negative impact from higher income taxes. In particular, the Netherlands, where we have a large part of our financing, introduced a limitation on the tax deductibility of interest charges applicable from 2019. The diluted EPS Bayer ended at 4.38 euros, so 4.9% higher than in 2018. 
This still includes the dilutive effect of three cents from the sale of Heineken NV shares to CRE as part of our agreement to join forces in China. Free operating cash flow amounted to 2.2 billion euros, pretty much flat versus the previous year, including the one-off positive impact of the first adoption of IFRS 16. And finally, our net debt to EBITDA ratio reached 2.6 times. Note that this includes the net investment in China for about 2 billion and the impact of IFRS, which brought alone 1.3 billion of lease liabilities onto the balance sheet. IFRS alone represents an additional 0.1 times in the ratio, so as you can see, we're very close to our commitment to stay at or below 2.5. I'm now looking at slide 8 and our net revenue bayer of 23.9 billion euros. Consolidation changes had a negative impact of 0.5% or 119 million. Uh, the negative effect of our divestment of China and of the first implementation of IFRS uh, were largely offset by the positive effects from other acquisitions, primarily uh, Namislov in Poland. Currencies had a positive translational impact this year, last year, increasing net revenue by 1.2% or 278 million euros. This was mainly attributable to gain in the Mexican peso, the Vietnamese dong, and the US <coughs> dollar, partially offset by losses in the Brazilian reais and uh, the Haitian uh, gold. On an organic basis, our top line delivered growth of 1.3 billion euro or 5.6%. Volume growth was 2.2%, with consolidated beer volume up 3.1%. The largest contributors to that growth were Brazil, Vietnam, and Cambodia. Europe was broadly stable as it faced a challenging comparable versus the summer of 2018, where we had great weather and the World Cup. Revenue per hectolitre grew 3.3%, with the underlying price mix on a constant geographic basis at 3.4%. In Asia Pacific, uh, in APAC and AME, we implemented robust pricing for the year, with the exception of Nigeria. In Europe, the mixed impact came in strong due to the growth of our premium and low and no portfolios. And in the Americas, price mix was well balanced between the growth of premium in Brazil and pricing ahead of inflation in Mexico. Let's now look at the development of the operating profit Bayer on slide nine. First, consolidation changes. They had a small negative impact of 0.6% or 21 million. Currencies had a positive translational impact, increasing reported operating profit by 2.1% or 80 million, which come from the same currencies as for revenues. The organic growth was 3.9% or 153 million euro, which pretty much all came in the second half. The acceleration was mostly derived from the factors that we discussed at first half. Input cost eased in the second half, increasing around 5% per hectoliter on an organic basis for the full year. And this is in line with the guidance that we gave at the beginning of the year. The increase for the full year had three components, if you wish, each of roughly equal weight. Higher commodity prices from our 2018 hedges, transactional currency effects, quite a lot on Brazil, and also the mix of products. Commodities driving the impact were barley, energy for glass, and aluminium. And as for the negative transactional impact, again, it mainly affected Brazil. The phasing of expenses also helped us in H2, and that is true for some of our international sponsorships, as well as for our investments in digital transformation and technology upgrade. In both cases, we had already stepped up our game somewhat in the second half of 2018, and therefore, the comparison base was more favorable in H2 than it was in H1. In addition, during the second half, our margins benefited from a more favorable mix. For instance, in Brazil, our premium and mainstream portfolios markedly outpaced the growth of our lower margin economy brand. The mix also benefited from the acceleration of volume growth in Vietnam, where margins are above group average. Regarding Vietnam, it is also interesting to highlight that in the end, we did not see in 2019 a significant uplift from the earlier set. I move now to uh, the diluted EPS Bayer on slide 10. So 4.38 euro for 2018, up 4.9% or 2010. 
we have here a negative impact of 0.7% or 3 cents from consolidation changes. On the positive side, this impact includes our share of profit from CRB in China between May and October. On the negative side, there are also some dilutive impacts linked to smaller acquisitions and to the first implementation of IFRS 16, which we are treating as a consolidation change. Currency translation brought a benefit of 2.3% or 8 cents. The sale of Heineken share to CRE resulted in a dilution of 0.7% of 3 cents. And so excluding this, our EPS organic growth was 4.3%. Cash flow on slide 11. So free operating cash flow reached 2.2 billion. Um, and of the 811 million increase of cash flow from operation, about 250 million came from the one-off benefits of the implementation of IFRS 16. If I move to working capital, it was basically flat versus 2018. Receivables and inventories moved broadly in line with the increase in our top line and the mix of our operations. Payable did continue to improve, but less than in 2018, where we saw a strong improvement in our payment terms, particularly in Brazil following the integration of our acquisition. The average payment terms improved by about 10 days this year, and we believe that they are now pretty much at industry standard. CAPEX reached 1.9 billion euros, which was a little bit below our guidance of slightly above 2 billion, and represented 8% of net revenue. Significant investments included capacity expansions in our Vungtau brewery in Vietnam, in four of our breweries in Brazil to increase our output of premium beer, particularly Heineken, and in Sedibang in South Africa. It also included a step up in net investment to refurbish the pub estate in the UK. And finally, let's go to the outlook for 2020. Um, so in 2020, our strategic focus remains growth-oriented, so we anticipate to continue to deliver superior top-line growth through a combination of volume, price, and premiumization. We also anticipate a low single-digit increase of input cost per hectolitre on an organic basis, with the benefit of lower prices in some commodities to be largely offset by transactional currency headwinds and product mix. Note here that today we have hedges for around 70% of our main commodities, so that normally gives us a pretty good view. We will also continue with cost management initiatives and productivity improvement to fuel investments behind our brands, innovation, digital transformation, and sustainability agenda. As a result, we currently expect operating profit VAR to grow by mid-single digit on an organic basis, barring major negative macroeconomic and political developments. In particular, it is currently not possible to assess the extent and duration of the impact of the novel coronavirus on the economy and on our business. And finally, let me give you some color on more technical elements of our guidance. We anticipate an average interest rate and an average effective tax rate broadly in line with 2019, and CAPEX related to property, plant, and equipment of around $2 billion. And with that, I would like to hand back to Jean-Francois for some final remarks before we open the floor to your questions. I think we can go immediately to the So with questions. that, I'd like to open the floor to your questions. I think you Is that yeah. better? <laughs> yeah. that is a good idea. Thank you. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad now. If you change your mind and want to remove your question, please press star 2. The first question today comes from Trevor Sterling from Bernstein. Please go ahead, Trevor. Uh, morning, Jean-Francois and Laurence. Uh, before I dive into the questions, just wanted to wish you all the best, Jean-Francois, for the next chapter. And many thanks for all the patient explanations over the last 15 years. No, thank you. I will do my best for the last time then. <laughs> thank you, Trevor. <laughs> so three questions, please, as ever. The first one, uh, as you reflect on the results and the individual countries, Jean-Francois, which countries give you the greatest pleasure? You say that's a really good job. And which countries do you think is still work in progress? Um, the second question, a bit more technical, uh, Laurence, you highlighted the 37 million incremental IT expenses in Europe. Is that something that we should expect to be ongoing as you roll out the systems and eventually fall out? Or uh, perhaps a little bit of color there would be helpful. And final question, the drink driving legislation in Vietnam, I appreciate it's very, very early days. 
Uh, I note that industry volumes were down 4% in the first month, uh, but can you give us any colour about how things are working out and how you expect things to evolve? Um, the first one, we can hold the floor for another hour and giving you colour to my, my favourite ranking, but I, I don't <laughs> think that would be very useful. I think you have um, you would have three. What is important in business is always that you you know how what what's the future potential of of any businesses, and so you have businesses that you run for you know kind of a steady slow growth, and you have others where you have to do a, a turnaround, and then you have third third ones which are really in the making in the building. So you you have a uh, all categories of these kind of businesses around the globe in all geographies and you have always somewhere somehow countries which are doing more than expected and you have a few countries who suddenly have a fallout and and I think that has been my experience ever in these 15 years is that you have to deal with 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 reality but what the strategy behind is is um, that we have been placing bets on on, on new countries year after year after year in mature but also in developing markets and more in developing markets than in mature markets. Um, and I think that those who are still uh, in, in the building and, and where I watch them very closely is, of course, Brazil in the first place. It's going to be China with, through, through the CRB. It's going to continue to be India and a couple of countries in Africa uh, to come because those are markets where we still have a lot of potential ahead of us. When you come, it comes to European markets, it's more about how can you engineer a steady, slow growth in markets which otherwise are saturated in our categories and which are not uh, fueled by demographic growth intrinsically. So that, is a, that takes, of course, an other approach. But if we look at the world today, we have covered geographies pretty well. Uh, I would say, um, and and so, the, and then you have the countries where you you need to do a kind of a turnaround, where you had better fortunes in the past, and you 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 have to re-engineer another business model. And I think particularly about Nigeria as an example of these. Um, so that is just to give a, a color. But I think for anyone who is at the helm of a portfolio company like us. Uh, would 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 have to look at these things and place every operation in its cycle, uh, in the lifetime, and and run it accordingly. Uh, overall, um, you have to continue to engineer the sum of the parts in order to give the profile of growth that we try to do year after year, which is a superior top line growth, and with improving uh, operating uh, results. The latter part is, of course, a bit more volatile. Um, what, what I'm, um, I would say, pleased with is that we can sustain the top line uh, growth <coughs> through, you know, managing our geographies on the one hand, and also managing our uh, product portfolio, our offerings, and our investments in distribution and in digitalization uh, for for making our business grow. Thank you. That was all. On your second question, Trevor, um, yes, 37 million incremental on uh, concentrated on Sharpex, which is our technology trans backbone transformation in Europe. We're going to be delivering the first set of capabilities in that transformation and in that tool in 2020. Uh, you should expect that this is going to increase still a bit in 2020. At some point, probably towards 2021, it will level but you should definitely expect that those expenses are part of the digital transformation of the company as we move on and for the foreseeable future. So we're still in a ramp-up phase, and ramp-up, as you could see, was a bit more in first half than in second half because your comparison base was different. Uh, so at some point, that will also level, uh, but another year of increase there. Legislation in Thank Vietnam, you. you want me to cover that? Yeah, I, I think the legislation in Vietnam, it, um, it, it, on, on, on itself, it is a welcome legislation. Of course, we, we take the view worldwide. When, you, when you, you drive, you never drink, so you have to be very coherent. We believe that that is the only sustainable policy uh, going forward. So that is not a discussion. The impact of it that we will see, 
Um, I know that everybody has plunged on one article published with a with a very high number. Now it it, it seems to me rather at the high side. It would induce that half the population is basically driving and not in state of being capable of driving in, in in the cities in Vietnam. I don't think. I don't think that kind of number would be reality. That it will have an impact for sure, but it it has to be seen over a longer period of time for the simple reason that. A, in January, we didn't see anything because we had debt and we had a very good debt. Um, you have the unfolding coronavirus, which affects mainly China, but will also have ripple effects in surrounding countries. And there also, you can't make any prediction. But then bear in mind that Vietnam stays uh, a growth country. And so you have you know, uh, conjunctural things going up and down and structural things, which is the growth of the market and tougher drink and, and, and drive laws. That will be enforced. I hope it sh it should be, um, and and that will net out. But I keep on pointing out to the fact Vietnam is intrinsically still a growing uh, beer market. Super. Thank you very much, Jean Francois. Thank you, Trevor. The next question comes from Edward Mundy at Jefferies. Please go ahead, Edward. Uh, morning, Jean-François. Morning, Laurence. Um, three for me. Um, the first uh, for Laurence. Um, I'm not asking for, for margin guidance, um, but are you able to highlight whether there are any new initiatives on cost management or productivity improvements relative to, let's say, you know, six or 12 months ago? Um, and you know, in your mind, what are the key levers um, to delivering mid-single-digit organic EBIT growth? Um, the second question is on, on Western Europe. Um, do you anticipate a better year there, given more normalized weather comps, uh, as well as the European Football Championships? Um, and the third one for Jean-Francois, uh, as you pass on the baton, you're putting yourself in Dolph's shoes. What, what do you see as the biggest opportunity for Heineken over the next decade or so? I'm already so grateful that the first question, first question is, for, is for me. That doesn't happen much this morning, so uh, I will answer with pleasure, not giving you a margin guidance, of course. Uh, so the, uh, the leading factor behind the organic EBIT growth, which was the second part of your question, is definitely the superior top-line growth to start with, and the tilt of that superior top-line growth towards premiumization, which is continuing. If you look at even one specific market like Brazil, and you know that Brazil is tilt, something that plays negatively on our margin because the average margin of Brazil is still much lower than the group average. When here, there, you see that really a large part of the growth uh, and strong double-digit growth comes from our uh, premium and mainstream, upper mainstream portfolio, Heineken, of course, but also Amstel and Bevasa. And that does help with EBIT growth, our operating profit growth, and that will help ultimately will tilt the margin in Brazil as well. So I would say superior top-line growth driven by premiumization uh, price, because we're very intentional on taking price when we can, the mix, that will, uh, th that, that is what, uh, and the volume, that is what plays the most. Of course, we continue to work relentlessly on productivity, and, uh, and there is, I mean, the paramount example in this company is definitely supply chain, uh, where we have a very decentralized production tool we produce where we sell, where our consumers enjoy our beer, which also, by the way, sometimes protect us from some uh, reaction. I mean, we are actually producing and employing people where people drink our beer and our consumers are. And, and there, with that footprint, uh, we have managed to drive productivity year on year. And we're already looking at the next stage of productivity and efficiency through digital, through connecting our breweries, through using uh, artificial intelligence and augmented reality. So that is something that's never ending. There is always a new frontier here. So that is part of what we're doing. And then constantly we're revisiting the size of our operation. We're revisiting the cost base of our operations. Uh, in all their dimensions, whether it is uh, uh, commerce, as you know, commerce, uh, you have to look at uh, advertising and marketing. You also have to look also at, at all the digital firepower that you can put behind your brand uh, and, and how you can target this, this, this marketing and how you can target your sales much better than you used to or with, with tools that actually get the consumer where they are, pretty much on their phones. Uh, and we're also looking at support costs. So there are a number of plans that have been implemented in the past. There are a number of plans that actually have been announced in a number of European countries in particular, but not only. 
Um, and that is not only a major country versus emerging country. If you look at a country like Mexico, it's been able to weather really very strong uh, um, headwinds from currencies by actually finding productivity and efficiencies year after year after year. So you always have to get back to your cost base and make sure that it is tailored to your uh, activity, but also to your environment, frankly. Yeah. And then about uh, your question, whether you know I should step in Dolph's shoes or he should step in mine, that's a bit confusing what's going to really happen. But if you give me, you ask me about an outlook of what what are we for the next 10 years, if only I had a crystal ball. I, I think you, you, your first as a strategy is a continuum. I think we are not in an industry where you have to expect a brutal disruption. Uh, that is not going to happen, but you can have strong evolutions, and, and that is what, what I hope for. But I cannot uh, preclude, and you will have to ask the question to Dolph in six months' time and in a year time and every year um, as time moves on. I think when, uh, when you look at our industry, um, a company that does not grow is a company that will die. It's very simple. So I don't know any substitute for success of a company than being able to engineer its growth. That means that you have to evolve constantly, and the book is never finished um, of, of, of a company. What I can see for the coming 10 years is, first of all, that um, your strategy is most probably more differentiated region by region than it has ever been before. And that is in contrast to the, the fact that we say we live in a global world because Internet connects us all, but the business agenda will be very different. Um, the, uh, the atomization of demand and the customization of offer in the West uh, is accelerating, whereas having big super brands in some countries is still the relevant way of having a successful and growing business for the next coming 10 years. So the, the, the speed at which um, demand will evolve is not going to be overall uh, everywhere the same and you have to do justice uh, to that differentiation which means that you have also to constantly adapt your organization and your strategy for that i think tendentially we will offer more products we have more than doubled our product offering on an organic base not just considering the acquisitions we made but if you take every operation in the world they have over the last eight years doubled their their skus on offering at least there is overall a tendency of offering more choice. We will all go for premiumization because as the demand for core beer will decline, that's inevitable, people will look for more value. And it inevitably, inevitably also begs the question about um, do you go beyond beer? And that it is a question which remains largely unanswered globally, but which uh, can be answered country by country, market by market, and and in a relevant way. And in a way, that's what we do with cider, that's what we do with craft beers, that's what we do with zero, zero, low alcohol beers. And, and the fine tuning is, is regionally very different. Beyond that, you have also to look at um, value chain integrations, vertical or horizontal. Um, also, that will evolve over time. I don't believe that business is static. You always have to look in in every geography where you operate, where are the next natural opportunities for growth in those geographies where, where you operate? And I think that it is naturally there where we will look. Um, and and I'm, I'm confident if, if I look what we have been doing, not only for the last 10 or 15 or 20 years, but for the last 150, four years. Um, I think that is what ahead of us um, but the changes are going to be there. The volume is globally, or the volume growth of core beer category is globally decelerating, but with very marked differences between geographies. Some geographies have still huge potential increase. Think about India or the whole African continent for beer category that is still, you know, big increases to expect. In Europe, none. So the and that's what I mean by you will have to continue to develop a differentiated uh, geographical approach. And I am now set that I have to stop. Ah, there is a question on Western Europe. <laughs> so th there I stop. Uh, 
Edward, and then a question on Western Europe. Uh, yeah, the question the question was, um, do, do you anticipate a better year um, given the more normalised weather comp as, as well as the European Football Championships? Well, let, June was very bad. The <laughs> the, the well, let's June last year, it was, last year was very bad. So we would hope. Think about, we, we said it, we not only continue to sponsor uh, the Champions League, also the Formula One, and we have the Euro Cup in addition. Now, if you have better weather for that, um, let, let's pray for the better weather, but already the programs in place in Europe for, for, the, for the first half are good, so I, I leave it at that. Great, thank you. Our next question is from Simon Hales at City. Please go ahead, Simon. Uh, thank you. Um, morning, Sean Francois. Morning, Lawrence. Um, three questions as well, please. Um, um, firstly, uh, uh, over the last sort of couple of years, clearly the, the profit delivery between sort of the first and second half has been a little bit more volatile than it's been in the past. Uh, I appreciate you know, part of that's been weather, but part of it, you know, as, as you flagged, has been some cost phasing. As you look to 2020, should we expect you know, a more balanced delivery of the mid-single digit organic EBIT growth between H1 and H2? Is there anything in particular you can see at this stage uh, that might skew it uh, to one period or the other? Um, secondly, can I just ask you around sort of the marketing expenses? Obviously, marketing and selling expenses in the year were growing a little over 4%, so below sales growth. Could you give us a little bit of a color as to what marketing investment was doing within that? Just marketing investment down as a percentage of sales, or were you still investing uh, you know, ahead of the curve? Uh, and then just finally, Jean-François, I think on Mexico, you mentioned in your remarks that uh, some more OXO stores have gone non-exclusive as we've come into 2020. Could you give us a little bit more color as to the numbers uh, that have actually sort of uh, uh, become potentially uh, competitive areas there and generally how you see the, the underlying business in Mexico uh, developing this year given the weaker macro backdrop? So I'll start with your question on profit delivery. Uh, yes, the weather plays a role. What also plays a role is a very balanced footprint that we have now. Uh, with, for instance, if you look at uh, at Brazil, uh, I would say the high season is really uh, around November, December, and then the beginning of the year, which is quite different from some of our traditional markets. And and since they contributed highly to the increase of profits uh, in in the past in the past two years, that has also played a role. Uh, so we don't guide, as you know, half by half. Uh, what you, we can say is that uh, it's a bit coming back to the answer to the previous question, is that the first half in 2019 was marked by more difficult comparables in terms of the, 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 the basis for some commerce expenses uh, and, or, and technology upgrade, and also by a very bad month of June in terms of weather and also in terms of uh, um, increased competitive environment uh, in, in Europe. Uh, so that I can tell you, uh, and then and then for the rest we'll have to see with uh, with uh, with the events as they as they develop. But if I compare what what we entering the first half with, uh, there are a number of things that plus a number of events that take place this year, of course, uh, like the Euro Cup, and that that play is more favorable. Uh, in terms of marketing expenses, this is pretty stable huh, in terms of uh, of percentage of of the revenue, and then you say marketing and selling. 11, uh, 11 point percent, and then we were at 11.1 percent last year. And when you look at support behind the brand, brand first the proof is in the pudding. Yeah? So when you have superior top line growth, balance between volume and revenue per hectoliter, it means that we're doing something right for the brand. So that is really something that you should be first looking at. And then the other thing is that you know when you look at our technology upgrades, so some of them are the pure digital backbone, and we're talking uh, our uh, ERPs and SAPs of this world. But uh, quite a lot of them are also at the service, direct service of the brand. Uh, so you would have we also invest in, in different forms today. But again, you know, 11% versus 11, 11.1, and the top line growth that we delivered this year, I, I wouldn't be too worried about that one. Well said, Lord. I think it, it is like that. Think about efficiency of ATL, BTL investments like we do in productivity. You don't have better productivity by taking ingredients out of your product. No, it's by having uh, first time right and no losses. Well, in, in marketing and sales, it's a little bit the same philosophy. And, and so over time, we expect to be able to engineer a, a good top line growth 
and you know having our resources better allocated. So that explains that the slight improvement year over year of the ratio, the ratio uh, and Wills maintaining a superior top line growth. So you, you have to think about that by the way. Um, and then the last one is, is about the OXO stores. I don't know if we, you know, I, I have a very detailed overview of how that goes province by province, quarter by quarter, when they go over. And it has all been engineered by our local team in order to exactly uh, minimize the impact for us and maximize the impact for OXO. Uh, it, it sounds contradictory, but it is like that. So starting in regions where um, the, 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 com the competitor was strong, was giving OXO a lot of opportunities, and we were not losing that much. We were losing, but not that much. And so we, we kind of move up north, where our market share will be stronger. But mind you, that if you, uh, the, the more shelf space you give it at, for brands that are not really in demand, well, they will also lose you know, the, the turnover on the shelf space allocated to the competitor. Is the same thing, you know, if they give too much to Modelo in the north and we were giving too much in the south, nobody's winning in the thing. So you have to realize that we have built that that deal as, as the optimal win-win. Overall, it is clear we will lose over the period of transition volume. There's nothing we can do about it. We lose mechanically volume, um, and that will go to competition. Though you have also to imagine that that volume is at a much lower margin for us, at a very high margin for OXO. Um, you have to ask the question whether OXO had the same margin on the volume they gained with the other guys. But that's a separate model altogether. So you have to see this as a communicating vessel thing. Overall, I have to say the team is managing that well, and the impact in volume is there. But in terms of returns and profitability, given all things, it is absolutely manageable, and it is not bringing neither the, 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 the Mexican operation in its isolation and certainly not Heineken in problems. And, and we are expecting to continue to grow overall in Mexico over the period of the transition because that is a net of this impact and of good underlying trends for our business, also based on the very good performance of our premium. Huh? The, yeah, the yeah, Heineken yeah. brand is now making inroads and... Uh, and then that premium is still pretty low. I don't low, sound so optimistic true. enough. That is, <laughs> <laughs> that is, uh, but I, I just wanted to. But you're right. The, the, the business is, of course, continue to growing in its premium part. And, and so for us, the OXO contract is, is a good new contract. It's a, a contract in which we can have long-term relationships with, with OXO. And, you know, we live in a competitive, competitive world out there. And we are very well positioned uh, in, in, in Mexico, really. Um, you know, very satisfied with it. No, that's very helpful. Um, can I just check, Lawrence, just going back to some of the, your comments around the margin drivers, uh, you referenced in the statements just bigger transactional FX headwinds around COGS. Is that also spread through the year? It's not particularly skewed to uh, in one half or the other, given the Brazilian real or some of the other EM currencies you've got exposure to? I am not going to give you the breakdown, but but really the Brazilian mm. real is uh, mm. is the one that probably uh, is the most challenging, or that we expect to be the most challenging. Yeah? There are other currencies, but this one is, I would say, the largest exposure. If you look at uh, the volumes of, mm. of 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 gear, I mean, that's yeah. uh, Brazil is our largest market. It's become the largest market for uh, uh, for Heineken, and and you know that I mean, a number of things have to be bought in hard currencies. So that does play a role, and the same way that we've had, we've seen the Mexican operation having to uh, absorb that. Well, our Brazilian operation moving forward, this is very much integrated in their plans, and the way we look at it is planning to have to absorb a contrary impact on that. Huh? So that that is why we are moderating a bit uh, the uh, positive impact of, uh, of of the commodities prices. That's great. Uh, thanks ever so much, and all the very best for the future of as well. Thank you. Our next question is from Sanjeet Aujla from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead, Sanjeet. Uh, hi, Bert. Uh, three questions from me also. Uh, firstly, on Nigeria, uh, how are you feeling uh, about the underlying uh, market there? And are you in a position yet uh, to be able to lead on pricing? Um, secondly, on Brazil, Laurence, you, you highlighted margins are still way below group levels. Uh, when would you expect uh, those margins to get 
uh, close to group levels. I think that was the the, the medium term target. Uh, and then just on on the growth of the Heineken brand, um, of the eight percent growth that you've seen, how much is zero contributing to that? Thank you. So we are not splitting the Heineken brand between zero and and uh, and, and the mother uh, brand. Also, because what you're seeing uh, is that you have far less cannibalization than what you had, for instance, when we launched Heineken Light in a number of markets. Because with Heineken Zero, zero alcohol, you're actually getting to some non-beer outlets. You're getting to occasions where people don't drink beer or don't drink alcohol anymore, such as lunch. And you're actually also appealing to people who don't want to drink alcohol or cannot drink alcohol in certain occasions. What we're saying is that basically uh, Heineken has the strongest performance in over a decade. Actually, if you check the quote last year, you'll find that we already said that. So this is another record year uh, versus last year. And I can repeat what I said last year. Uh, last year, we said that uh, the performance of the brand, even excluding Heineken 00, was the strongest in a decade. And, and this year, the performance, the growth of the brand, even excluding Heineken 00, is pretty much the same as last year. Uh, so this should be uh, uh, encouraging. <laughs> but we don't split, and we won't split it because it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't make sense. Uh, then your question on uh, uh, Brazil. Um, the mid-term guidance is that uh, the, the RONA, the, the return on net assets, will be above WAC uh, within five years. And, and that is definitely the case. So this is uh, the guidance we gave was in terms of how it pays for the cost of capital. And that is definitely what we, what we are see, seeing in, in that time frame. In terms of the margin, um, you know, it, the margins will move up. They have to move up also as a factor of premiumization. Uh, and, and this will develop. I am not telling you today how long it will take, where exactly it will go, but definitely we continue to work on margin. And the portfolio has also a natural tilt that will help us and that is helping us working on margin. Remember, we're starting from a low base. Huh? We were low single digit uh, in the Heineken part of the portfolio, and we acquired a business that was losing money. This is going fast. Some of the synergies will be a bit delayed in terms of uh, uh, reunited the distribution, but all the synergies in terms of back office, in terms of breweries, are being extracted. So we're very happy about how this is going, and this is uh, uh, an operation we're building for the great future. You see the growth. <laughs> You see the growth of the Heineken brand there, and that tells you that it's going in the right direction. And then Nigeria. That's my most difficult thing for the moment, uh, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a listed company, so you can follow it. It is. Um, um, we, the, the market is going better, so that's, that's the good news. Pricing is not going anywhere. We, we have increased last year our prices in November, if I recall well, and and we just did it again in, in January, but that is because of a VAT uh, increase. Now, um, it, it, you know, the, our our bigger competitor in the world, the smaller industry, <coughs> immediately announced that uh, it, it will not increase the prices uh, before uh, March. So it remains a very tense competitive environment. Uh, don't know what we want to, where we, we go there. We, we hold up our share. We're still market leader, I think. You know, in beer, Diageo is suffering um, more in, in, in terms of share, if you will, but I don't, you know, it, it remains a, a pain point. So um, we, we continue to, to believe that, after all, um, we, we work a lot on productivity. And I have to say that the teams over there, I, I went there late last year, they have done a, a, a tremendous job in, in, in terms of productivity and re-engineering the business for operating at structurally much lower prices than we had, let's say, five years ago. So that job is has been done and is currently still being done. On the other hand, the good news out of Nigeria is that the premium end of the portfolio is tilting up, but the overall pricing is still lagging behind. So um, don't ask me to make too much projections, but uh, um, I can tell you this, this is a this is indeed. Uh, a real concern because the profit pool of that whole market has stumbled quite a bit um, over the last few years. This is just a bare uh, reality. So it is high on our radar screen. All right, thank you. 
So the last question we are taking on the call comes from Tristan Van Streen from Redburn Partners. Please go ahead, Tristan. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Just a couple from me. Uh, just the, the first one, if I have my numbers correct, it appears that 2019 was the first year you've been able to get price and mix that's in line or even exceeding the uh, weighted inflation of your markets, which is quite an impressive achievement. So one, one thing, is, is 2019 unique because you took some extra pricing uh, because of the input cost pressure, or is this kind of the new philosophy going forward in the markets where that's possible? Obviously not Nigeria, but in other markets, is that just the way Heineken is thinking about it at the moment? The second question, a bit more detailed, uh, Laurence, as you close the preparation phase on your um, uh, your HANA implementation in Europe, what are you doing to mitigate any disruption that you may have in the implementation uh, of the deployment of the program? Uh, can we expect some rolling stock-ups in some markets of inventories before you actually implement the program? How should we think about that? And then last question, but simply a, a very big thank you, Jean-Francois, and I wish you much luck. Enjoy as you venture forward. Thank you for the last one. Um, Question on price mix, uh, Tristan. Yeah. You usually have your numbers right, so uh, <laughs> if you look at 2019, it's pretty much 50-50 price and mix, but it's very different from one place to another. As you know, we did say it, input cost higher this year. We have to be intentional, and this is something that we, we, we say internally, and we say, you know, there need to be a very good reason not to take price. But I mean, we operate in places where affordability is is a key uh, is a key issue. We operate in places like Europe, where basically you have a deflationary, significant deflationary impact. So there, if you look at Europe, it will be efforts on pricing, but it will be a lot of mix and premiumization. So, so I wish we could run the company on philosophy. Uh, it's uh, it's run very much on being intentional uh, in going towards premium, in taking pricing while keeping our products an affordable luxury, uh, which which they ha they are and they have to be. Uh, and, uh, and and then we do it on a case by case basis. And and our um, our management teams are very connected to their countries and their environment. What we did is we did actually blow a little bit the horn this year and say, guys, this is difficult here in terms of uh, input cost. So you have to actually uh, look at what you can do on the side of pricing. And we will continue to be pragmatic and reacting, and it will also depend on the mix of countries. Uh, that that will be uh, so. So that is that is our uh, the way we're gonna we're gonna run it. Um, um, as for Hana, you will notice that I carefully say this is the first phase of of capabilities. We're starting with the data. We're starting with actually having a unified uh, data uh, management. And that's what's going to happen pretty much in, uh, in 2020. And we're going to actually uh, standardize and normalize whatever's done at our shared service center in Pakao. So we could go in much more details into the way we are transitioning, and I can cover that in, uh, uh, separately. Uh, that's mm -hmm. what our plans are. But we are starting with basically the core of the financial processes for all our 20 markets centralized in Krakow. And the first step is about unified data model. So, uh, so hopefully that doesn't bring any kind of disruption in the operation because we're not transferring the transactional part of it yet. Okay. So it's when you start transactioning in the new system. Uh, you know, to give you an example, last year, uh, not last year, 2018, when we actually merged our two SAP systems in Brazil, we had a few days where we could not invoice. Mm. That is actually when you merge system, you start transacting and you decommission your old ways of transacting. That is kind of like the, the, the cutoff moment. Uh, that's part of life. You, you do everything you can to mitigate it. Sometimes it happens and you have to have contingency plans in place. That's also part of the preparation. It doesn't mean that you're completely safe and immune to anything, to everything. But, uh, but that, that, um, that is the way it goes. And it's more, it's the data this year in Europe, more than the transaction. Tristan, just, if, I had, yeah. if I had to put a philosophy behind the price mix thing, and I, because I listened to Laurence and she said there, there is no philosophy, there is a lot of pragmatism. But if you absolutely want to make a philosophy, it, it would be mix always, price wherever you can. <laughs> and as, as you you heard about my Nigeria story, that latter part is a bit more difficult. I'm going so to have it framed is, above my desk. The philosophy, then, if you if you'd like. Yeah. Thank you. That's very clear. 
Well, so for all unanswered questions, we refer you back to the Heineken Investor Relations team. I will now hand back to the Heineken team for any closing remarks. Well, it has been a pleasure, uh, as ever, to have you this morning for an hour, and um, and, and and thank you for for uh, the good collaboration we had uh, during the past uh, year. So I'm 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 just looking forward to see you, maybe in other capacity. So thank you very much, uh, all of you, and thank you, operator, for having uh, uh, organized the, the thing. And for every uh, further questions, please defer to the people who will stay behind me and will be competent to answer <laughs> all your questions <laughs> when I sneak out. Thank you so Thank much. You. <laughs> Over to you. Thank you. Bye-bye, all. Okay. Goodbye.